everyone. Today we are speaking with Jay McHecker, SCPM 2023 Raymond Simor Paleontology Medal winner. My name is Sergio Celis, I'm from Colombia, but I am a PhD student from Granada University in Spain. I study sedimentology and ethnology from well courts and outcrops of the Colombian Caribbean. And I had the pleasure of hosting the conversation today with a person that we read a lot every day. So welcome, James. Congrats. And thank you for being here. It's a pleasure to be here, Sergio. Thanks for taking the time to chat with me. OK. To start, could you summarize your part in the geoscience? Sorry, pardon me? Oh, into the ge geosciences. Yes. It was pretty straightforward, really. Uh, my grandparents were fossil collectors and were interested in rocks. And I spent a lot of time in the summers with my grandparents. And so they would take me out with them when they were collecting fossils and joining the local rock club. And I began to realize how exciting it was to learn more about the Earth's past. And uh, that pretty much guided my interest through science as a high school student. And by, I think even in grade nine, I'd pretty much decided that I wanted to study paleontology and, and to be a geologist. So now they had such an impact on me that uh, as a professor, I uh, put the funds together to donate a prize for uh, undergraduate students in their name, for those students that show a passion for learning about the geosciences and uh, articulating it to the general uh, community. So. Okay. Okay. And uh, what are you most proud of in your, of in your career? Well, it's changed quite a bit. Uh, back and forth as my careers developed. I would probably say today, I really feel honored to be respected as a, a teacher and a mentor by students more than anything, I think. Uh, I think that has the longest impact on uh, the future. Papers sort of come and go, they fall in and out of favor, but I think if you make a positive impact on the training of a student that helps to guide them through their career, that has sort of a, a value that's much more long lived. So I'd say now that's my biggest uh, sense of, uh, of, of uh, accomplishment. But I've also been working most of my career towards finding ways to integrate sedimentology and ethnology uh, for developing FACES models, understanding paleoecology, depositional relationships, things like that. And uh, so I'm pretty proud of uh, the progress that uh, I've managed to make in that regard as well, from a research perspective. Yeah, great. Uh, have you encountered any challenges or setbacks that turn out to be valuable experiences? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and more than a few, but uh, the one that most comes to mind was uh, that I allowed myself to begin a PhD program in a subject area that was peripheral to my genuine areas of interest. And a number of circumstances kind of conspired to make it the case that I uh, went and started this program, but it was pretty clear within the first year that uh, this was not for me. And it was the first time in my life that I actually had to give up something that I'd started and recognize that it was a lost cause and uh, and sort of return back to my hometown and, uh, and figure out what to do with my uh, career. But ultimately that uh, led to a colleague of mine introducing me to uh, Dr. George Pemberton, who was looking for a PhD student at the time. And George and I hit it off immediately uh, when we were discussing uh, sort of futures and careers and he became one of my principal mentors and shaped really the career I have today. If it, if it hadn't have been for George, uh, I, there's no way I'd be where I am now. So it seemed like a big setback back in uh, uh, 1989, but uh, in the end, it was uh, uh, probably the best thing that could have happened for me. Okay. And if you could go back in time, is there anything you would do differently? Yeah, again, absolutely. I followed a lot of sort of questionable paths 
uh, in my research things that were ultimately fruitless. So uh, that didn't help. Um, I probably spent too much time in coursework doing things that uh, ultimately didn't matter for the uh, the actual classes. Probably things that I had that uh, even today I don't have any recollection having remembered doing, but uh, I know I put a lot of time into uh, those sorts of things. Um, uh, I think I was unfocused early on in my PhD. Uh, even though I had completed a master's, I was trying to learn that crucial first step where you have to make your thesis and your research your own. So not just simply have your supervisor tell you what to do at each stage, but to begin to frame, well, what are the real questions? What are the things that I want to try to solve? Well, what are the problems that need addressing? And to build up that skill set, I, I think I dithered around quite a bit before I finally cottoned on to this sense that you have to take ownership of the project. You can't just wait for somebody to tell you what to do next. You have to take it on yourself. And uh, finally, I got to that point uh, where I could start to shape the project and bring ideas to George rather than waiting for George to tell me what to do. And there's no doubt whatsoever that I could have spent less time in the university pub. Yeah. <laughs> and do you have a, a, a special person who inspire you? George, oh, probably, or so of what's fundamental to your successful career? Oh yeah, there's so many. I mean, when I was an undergrad, I didn't really think that uh, ecology was very interesting because right? I was always about body fossils and things like that. But once I found a passion for doing sedimentology and interest in stratigraphy and started to look at the rock record, it became pretty clear that ecology was really for silicic plastics was the way that you had to go forward to really begin to apply paleoecology and depositional relationships, animal sediment responses. So it didn't take long for me to instantly begin to admire the greats, Bob Fry, uh, uh, Richard Bromley, um, Dolph Seilacher, uh, you know, workers like that. Even, even ones whose research I wasn't uh, in agreement with, you could see that they really had set the stage for us to really begin to think about these problems more deeply. And so uh, they would probably be, for me, the, the bigger mentors. But uh, I've learned so much from colleagues that are uh, time equivalent to me, Luis Boutois, Gabriela Mangano. Their insights, their perceptions are foundational. They're their textbooks and writing are uh, exquisite and insightful. I've learned a lot just from seeing the work that they do and their contemporaries. And of course, my closest colleagues that I work with regularly, Carrie Ban, Murray Jingra, Shaheen Dashgard, they are ongoing collaborators where I learn more from them, I think, than they ever learned from me. And being able to interact with those brilliant minds are are a real privilege. So I consider them also mentors and then despite the fact that, that again we are essentially contemporaries. Okay. Nice. <laughs> and do you have any advice for a young professional and early career? Oh well I suppose uh, advice well I think developing skill sets that you can use uh, in a variety of ways, in a variety of uh, scenarios are, is pretty crucial. And for me, I think one of the most important things is to be a good observationalist, being able to accurately express what it is you see. Because it's the underpinning of almost all the, the data that you are ultimately going to interpret. If there's flaws in the way you're able to see the things that you're studying or to describe them, it's difficult to go forward. But to really build up that skill set, to be able to accurately look at a rock or look at a sedimentary unit and draw as much data out of that as possible, 
will really set you in good stead for moving forward. Um, you know, so many other things are interpersonal. Being able to get along with other people, being able to work collaborative, collaboratively with people, even if you don't particularly like them, is is a huge skill. It's it's one of the hallmarks of being a professional. And uh, you're not always going to get to work with people that you like or that are your friends. You're going to be working with people that you may think is a bit of a jerk. But I'll guarantee you that they are coming from positions of strength as well. They have insights, they have skills, and you need to avail yourself of their uh, contributions as well. And the way to do that is to be able to get along with people. Try not to be antagonistic. Try to be supportive. Be generous with your time. Be prepared to share your insights, not to force people to follow what it is you think need to be done, but to provide them some sort of advice or guidance on your part. Those all will serve you in good stead and help to build up a reputation within the community that you're a person that you can work with, that a person can work with, collaborate with. That's not going to ever hurt anyone's career, I don't think. Mm. There are so many other things too, but uh, yeah, kind of the first things that come to mind. <laughs> <laughs> Super important. Now I would like to ask you about some things in your daily routine. Okay. How do you, ma <laughs> how do you manage your time and maintain work-life balance? <laughs> well, I have to tell you, I'm a very poor time manager. <laughs> I I've never been very good at it. When things need to be done, I kind of focus entirely on that. And when things lighten off, I'll tend to slack off and do other things. I don't recommend other people necessarily follow that, but it's kind of just the way I've always been. Now though, that, is, that I'm you know married and have a couple of children and a full professor, I tend to resist doing university work on weekends, on in evenings, on holiday time, things like that, unless it's gonna negatively impact my uh, students. So if there's a, a thesis chapter that absolutely needs to be edited or uh, advice on a certain problem that they're working on, I will probably take time out to do that. But I do tend to resist that now. But I didn't do that when I started. When I started, I was, you know, I wanted tenure, I wanted to get promoted, and it seemed the way to do that was to focus as much of your time and effort into the job as possible. Now, in my situation, I kind of had an unusual start to a career because at, S at Simon Fraser University, they never had an earth sciences program when they hired me. So I was hired with two other geologists and one laboratory instructor to design an earth science program. And so for the first three years, every semester we were designing new courses and uh, and teaching our full load of courses. Uh, each semester you would be teaching older courses you designed the year before as well as designing new courses. We had no graduate program at the time, so there were no TAs. So we had to TA our own labs. We had to design the lab assignments. We had to grade everything ourselves. And so there was really very little time for anything else. When I think through the first three years, I can't think of anything that wasn't sitting in my office or sitting in front of a laptop working on earth science courses and earth science material, sitting in on meetings and things like that. It's not a template I'd recommend to anyone. But at the time, it seemed the most important thing to do. So uh, okay. I think people today are much better at time management and they better appreciate a work-life balance. I, I think my generation, it was, we were lulled into this false or a uh, sense that if you wanted to succeed, you basically had to pour your heart and soul into the job uh, in order to get ahead. So I think we're better off today than we were 40 years ago. Okay. And what skills have helped you to be essential at your job? What are some foundational skills that benefit all geoscientists? Uh, I guess, I'd, again, I'd fall back on that sort of uh, accurate observation, uh, be a, a good observationalist. Um, I would advise people not to overlook or marginalize things that seem anomalous. They're often 
the things that seem odd or out of place or the things that are not immediately easy to interpret often carry some of the most crucial information about the units you're studying. So you shouldn't marginalize those kinds of uh, challenging uh, observations that you make in the field or when you're looking at core or what have you. I think there's a tendency for people to latch on to the first most obvious interpretation that comes to mind when they first see something and then try to find other data that support that initial observation. I found that holding multiple working hypotheses in your head and testing them against one another uh, goes a long way to coming up with a more solid interpretation. And it also sets you up to be willing to let go of an interpretation in the light of new data, because you have already cultivated alternates to that. You're not suddenly having to discard something you've spent all your time building up as a model, only to find out that the unfortunate data set arises to show that the model doesn't work and the interpretation doesn't work. I think it's become less fashionable to work with multiple working hypotheses, but uh, I really still believe it is the way to move forward. Uh, uh, and so I found that is pretty, pretty helpful. And absolutely asking yourself questions. You know, I often will ask students, my graduate students, well, what do you see when you see this? Or what is this? Or what does that look like? Uh, and I'm constantly trying to train them to learn that those are the questions you need to ask yourself. You go in the field and you have a whole series of questions you ask. Well, what does this mean? What does that mean? What does this uh, relationship indicate? And as a result, instead of just collecting the data, you're actually also thinking about what the data might mean in the context of units that you're looking above and below and things like that. Those, those sorts of skill sets, I think, at least for the work that I do, is, is kind of essential. Yeah. And then reading the literature. That is, I'm sure you know, reading the literature is becoming harder and harder because there's just so much of it. But yeah. reading the literature and keeping abreast of your discipline is crucial to being successful. And we're all kind of imperfect in that regard. Luckily, reviewers are able to direct you to manuscripts or, or concepts that maybe you've overlooked. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, being abreast of the literature and, and learning from the work of other people continues to be a, a, an essential skill set to have. Super important, yeah. <laughs> Are, are success and fulfillment interchangeable within the context uh, of your experience? How do you define them? Uh, in my early days, I probably made that mistake. Uh, but I'd say that while there's a linkage between the two, there are absolutely different things. To my mind, um, success relates more to how others perceive you and how others perceive what it is you're doing. And so that can certainly affect your own sense of fulfillment, uh, but it's not the same uh, in the sense that, to me, fulfillment is more of an internal or personal evaluation of your level of satisfaction with life. And so, if my colleagues thought that my work was shoddy or mediocre and that I wasn't a particularly good science scientist, then yeah, I probably would feel less fulfilled. But on the other hand, if my life was falling apart uh, outside of geology, I doubt that my H index or citation numbers would make me feel any better. And so I think there, you have to keep those sorts of things separate. Although, as I said, I think there's a relationship there. Do you do you always enjoy what you do, or are there days you don't want to go to work? If I'm teaching and if I'm doing research, then absolutely, I can hardly wait to come into the office or go into the field or go to the core lab <clears throat> and describe the rocks that I'm studying. But a day that's designed around having to deal with, let's say, conflicts between colleagues or conflicts with students, or things that are just overwhelmingly administrative 
then I would rather be doing anything else. I really, really dislike administration duties. Although they are part of being a good university citizen, that it is not anything that I uh, excel at and I really don't enjoy it. So if I could get out of it, I would. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a common aspect in all directors. In I'm sure for a lot of research focused people, administration is as far from their mind as possible. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there has been a very important change in the geoscience in recent years, and I would like to ask you about some aspect of it. In your opinion, how has the geoscience been changed over the years? How do you see the geoscience and research evolving in the coming years? Hmm. Those those sorts of questions are rather daunting to try to to uh, resolve. I think we all have individual perspectives of things, and they're probably not as uh, inclusive as they could be. But I would probably say one of the things that I recognized throughout the course of my career is that the level of specialization within the disciplines has just moved by leaps and bounds. It's so difficult to be a generalist and there's so much focus necessary, I think, focus on specialization. But the more you delve deeply into a discipline, the more the work ends up being multidisciplinary. So while you are specializing increasingly within the area of interest, you're having to draw upon a wide range of techniques, skill sets, et cetera. And so it's become also more and more difficult to single author research or even co-author research. You need the expertise of so many more people now in order to really get into solving the question. So they're almost like the opposite effect, more and more specialized, but more multidisciplinary at the same time. And that's a difficult uh, road to uh, walk. And I think you really have to focus on trying to cultivate lots of positive collaborations with people who have a range of skills in order to really succeed. I think that I also see that uh, technology and the use of big data has very well or very much led to a focus on uh, quantitative analyses over qualitative analyses. And so the ability to use math and to use uh, statistics in order to deal with big data to solve problems is increasingly essential. And I'm not a very good mathematician. And so for me, it's been a daunting evolution to recognize that I really do lack the skill sets to deal with large volumes of data. But I think that's the way the science is going forward. Um, and, and it's gonna become increasingly important. Okay. Uh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, sorry. And I think one of the other things that, that has happened is that we've been our own worst enemy within the university community with this publish or perish mindset. And so it's increasingly a case that people are becoming more and more focused on quantity of manuscripts published over necessarily the quality or the impact value of those papers. And uh, the result is that it seems that we're publishing more and more papers that fewer and fewer people read uh, and not finding the time ourselves to read the papers that other people are writing because we're too busy writing our own papers. And it's because we've linked success and uh, salary to research productivity. And I, ad I admit that it's difficult to assess quality because generally the quality of research is something that you see you know, years after decades after uh, by the level of uptake uh, and things like that. It's a difficult metric to apply in the short term, but it's. I think it's the way the science has gone and I don't see an easy way for us to get out of that trap we put ourselves in. Yeah, yes, of course. <laughs> and and other, in the other side, what impact has your science research and practice made to ensure human sustainability? And what resource should we capitalize on to raise it? Because the geoscience changed a lot in, in that side. 
Yes, indeed. Well, it's I have something of an increasingly unpopular uh, perception, but I am a have been and remain a pretty strong supporter or advocate for uh, the geosciences that are resource based. So whether you're talking about minerals or critical metals for uh, evolution into the green economy, whether you're talking about energy resources, whether you're talking about groundwater resources, I think those aspects of the geosciences absolutely impact society. And we need to uh, continue to focus on uh, best practices for the exploration and development of such resources. And we need to continually look at ways to mitigate the uh, impact of those uh, uh, approaches. And we need to uh, dedicate far more um, resources to uh, pivoting towards using a range of, of energy types. I don't think any one energy source is going to be uh, viable in the future. I think we need a, a wide range of them. And we need to put more effort into not basically holding on to just a single uh, dominant energy source, but to look into the other ones. On the other hand, we also need to educate the general population that green energy and the pivoting to this system does not come with zero environmental cost. Every single, uh, everything we do has some sort of an environmental cost. And we need to decide, well, what are the costs we're prepared to pay? Yeah. It's, it's, I think it's naive to think that we're going to pivot in five years, 10 years, even 20 years to a non-fossil fuel economy for energy, but we can certainly reduce our requirement for it. And we can certainly find better ways to mitigate climate change and to deal with the negative outcomes of pursuing that. So, but uh, that is increasingly less popular of a, of a view, so. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and what are your thoughts on some universities around the world removing petroleum geology for their programs or something? Oh, sorry, I, I just missed that. I think there was. What are, you, what are you? What do you think about that? Uh, some universities removing uh, petroleum geology of the from their programs. Well, I mean, I think as long as it's being taught, uh, okay. I mean, some universities are good at groundwater resources. Um, some universities are better at subsurface analysis and petroleum, uh, but to remove aspects of the geosciences simply because it's unpopular, I think is a mistake. You know, yeah. many of the people who decry the use of hydrocarbons are still the ones that drive their SUVs to rallies to complain about fossil fuels, where people are quite prepared to fly around the world going on holidays using aviation fuel and aircraft. Right? So, we are using hydrocarbons, and if you just bury your head in the sand and not learn about them and learn how to employ best practices to reduce the negative impact of them, then you're actually not solving the problem either. Right? We're, it's naive to think that we're just going to move away in the short term from it, but we can do better than we have been, there's no doubt. Right? And, and I think companies, oil companies, need to be held accountable to some degree for the huge numbers of amount of profit they make while they are contributing less to the mitigation of the outcomes of that. But they are kind of starting to step up to the plate because they can see that the general population is not prepared to stand for it anymore. Yeah, and, and about technology, technology is a tool that has been widely used in hydrocarbon exploration projects, but now with the change, what are the new frontiers of technology? Or do you consider, do you consider that uh, we need to open other, other frontiers and paradigms in technology? Well, I'm sure. Um, I mean, I'm an academic at heart, so I'm 
interested in the use of trace fossils really from uh, less of an economic side, more of a understanding the uh, earth history. Um, but that requires being able to model the uh, distribution of animal sentiment responses and how that relates to likely depositional environments, changes in those environments with time, which then feeds back into uh, sequence stratigraphic problems, uh, allogenic changes in base level, shifts of depositional environment from, let's say, regressive to transgressive or forced regressive or all sorts of other scenarios. Traces are still going to be valuable for uh, those more academic pursuits. And of course, they will remain um, applicable to trying to predict distribution of potential reservoirs, potential seals, potential or potential uh, baffles within reservoirs for those that continue to do um, hydrocarbon research. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's up for this next generation to take a look at what's been done in the past, figure out what we were doing wrong and move the science forward. And I'm constantly excited to see the brilliant insights that the next generations have had in how to move the science of trace fossil analysis forward. So people like you, you know, people like uh, Sandupta Gupta, uh, Das Gupta and others, you know, the, the work that's being done is uh, outstanding. And uh, we'll, we'll learn a lot from watching uh, yeah. progress. <laughs> Great. Do you think that your scientists that your scientists are doing a good job at outreach to non geo scientists? We can we do better? Oh, absolutely okay. better. We are we are at best doing a fair job, and most of the time far worse than that. Uh, I think in general society thinks that geologists study rocks and that's it, and they don't really perceive the sort of scope of what it is a geoscientist tends to do. If they do, it's almost always conflated with what uh, geographers do, uh, as if it's the same discipline. And uh, why, well, granted, there is a lot of overlap and uh, interrelationships between the two. I think geology and, and uh, geoscience at large is, is discrete from many geographic uh, analyses and you know, high school mentors or, or guidance counselors often don't see the distinction between the two approaches. Even within universities, uh, earth sciences are generally regarded to be science for dummies. They don't give it the same level of respect that any of the pure sciences tend to have. And I think we need to educate the general population that really earth science is the application of all science disciplines to solving problems related to the earth, right? You have to be a chemist. You have to be a physicist. You need to be a biologist. You need to be a statistician in order to be able to use earth science data to solve problems. It's, it's the application of all of those sciences, which in a lot of ways I think makes it very profound and, and exciting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What are some of the key transferable skills you have been able to develop over your career? Which skills do you think will be most valuable for students and early career professionals to develop the, their career prospects? Um, well, I think by far the most important thing is the ability to think critically. And that's so true for so many sciences and the humanities, et cetera. A highly educated person is able to think critically. They don't, you know, just wander into an interpretation or, or blunder into understanding. They're constantly testing their observations against logic, against other observations that uh, other workers have made and put together uh, testable hypotheses. That sort of uh, transferable skill can be put into any 
aspect of life, I think. Uh, it's hard to develop, it takes time, but if you can take those accurate observations, um, ask yourself the key questions, consider multiple working hypotheses, discard an uh, hypothesis that is not founded by new relevant data, then you really have developed a set of skills that will essentially make you golden. It, it will be a very uh, desired uh, commodity for almost any kind of a career. Yeah, okay. And looking at the future trajectory of geoscience, what do you wish to get involved in or on? Well, I think I've actually found it in a lot of ways. You know, when I started off, it was all about doing research, writing papers, going to conferences and giving talks. But the older that I've gotten, the more I actually much more enjoy seeing that being done by students that I'm mentoring. I get so much pleasure out of watching the sort of eureka moment when a graduate student of mine or an undergraduate grasps a concept and you can see that they now really are beginning to understand or do understand some relationship and they make the science their own and they move forward by progressing that insight or idea and begin to new, do new things that people before them hadn't done yet. So being a part of that, being in a situation where you can help young professionals and developing scientists to become the best they can be, to write outstanding papers, to complete excellent theses, to give insightful, exciting talks at conferences, for me, that's really where my pleasure lies now, more than anything. Now, I like writing the odd paper now and then and having people read it and tell me that it wasn't a waste of their time and things like that. But the mentoring and training of the next generation of students and young professionals is where I get most of my joy. And so I'm like in exactly the job, the career that I think best suits my uh, aspirations for the future. Okay, thank you, James. Thank you very much for your for your time and congrats for the for the medal winner. It's, it was a pleasure to talking with you. Well, I appreciate it, and I thank you for your time as well. And I hope we have the opportunity to cross paths in person at some time, a conference or something like that. Um, it would be great to sit down with you and chat about your research and your own career paths and and career aspirations. So sure. thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care.